two long years since Jack Johnson had defended his crown, fireman Jim Flynn was knocked out by the champion in 1907, but he represented the latest white hope. Promoted Jack Curley guaranteed Jack Johnson $30,000 for his fourth title defense. But clearly this was not the same man who defeated James Jeffries in 1910. Jack was out of shape. Life had become a non-stop party during his layoff. A group of clergymen, prosecutors and detectives began working with a grand jury to scrutinize his private life. Jack was told he was being investigated, but he made no effort to change his free and easy lifestyle. His white wife, Edda Dourier, lived with the miseries of public rejection. It was a difficult time for the heavyweight champion. Jack Johnson and fireman Jim Flynn converged on Las Vegas, New Mexico in the summer of 1912. Because of the recent ban on the transport of fight films, promoter Jack Curley had trouble finding a crew to record the fight. Even with a two-year drought, boxing fans were not starving for a fight between an out-of-shape champion and a lightly regarded challenger. Only 5,000 people came to the arena, but thankfully local authorities relented and permitted Jack Curley to film the bout. On July 4, 1912, Jack Johnson returned to the ring. Round one. Promoter Curley has found someone to man his camera. July 4th, 1912, exactly two years since Johnson sent Jim Jeffries into oblivion. But time hasn't dulled his ringmanship. Give Johnson an audience, even a sparse one, and he rises to the occasion. When it places him, Johnson lands rapier punches on the pretender to his throne. completely demoralized. Skeptics might find it hard to believe that this same Jim Flynn, five years later, will flatten Jack Dempsey in a single round. Exasperated and determined to do damage, Flynn leaves his feet and propels his head under the champion's chin. The referee has words with the challenger. is exasperated. We're using Marcus of Queensbury rules, the referee cautions. I want both of you to follow the rules. By round nine, there is no let up. Flynn is still using his head, and Johnson, his defensive skills. Again, Flynn goes into this strange choreography. This time, the referee has much sterner words. What's this? A fourth man enters the ring. It's the sheriff who halts the proceedings. So once again, Jack Johnson wins by police intervention. After the fight, when Jack returned home to Chicago, his wife, Etta, suddenly committed suicide. Then in November of 1912, Jack Johnson was put under federal indictment on the grounds that he transported a white woman, Ms. Bell Shriver, across several state lines. This violation of the Mann Act of 1910 was passed in Congress to crack down on prostitution, and for four days, the heavyweight champion of the world was in jail. When he got out on bail, he had a jail sentence hanging over his head. 
Jack Johnson continued to defy the reformers. He married another white woman, Lucille Cameron, almost guaranteeing a stiff jail term. Within four months, Jack Johnson was on trial. In May of 1913, Jack Johnson was found guilty of violating the Mann Act and sentenced to one year and one day in a Joliet, Illinois penitentiary. He was also fined $1,000. Jack was terribly bitter, and he decided to jump bail. When he left the United States with his wife, Lucille, he promised it would be forever. The champion traveled to Canada, France, and finally England as the world's most famous fugitive. Jack Johnson was still the heavyweight champion of the world, but at this time in his life, he was a man without a country.